The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, amen. amen. Please be seated. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about weddings. According to historians, the earliest evidence of weddings or the ritual of weddings is over 4,300 years old. For thousands of years before that, most anthropologists believe families consisted of loosely organized groups of as many as 30 people, with several male leaders, multiple women shared by them, and children. As hunter-gatherers settled down into agrarian civilizations or people that harvested the land, society had a need for more stable arrangements. The first recorded evidence of marriage ceremonies uniting one woman and one man dates from about 2350 BC in Mesopotamia. Over the next several hundred years, marriage evolved into a widespread institution embraced by the ancient Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans. But back then, marriage had little to do with love or with religion. Flash forward to the 1980s and you have a five-year-old me sitting in front of a television watching The Little Mermaid and wondering how I could eventually have a fairy tale wedding but I digress. Marriage's primary purpose was to bind women to men and thus guarantee that a man's children were truly his biological heirs. Through marriage, a woman became a man's property. In the betrothal ceremony of ancient Greece, a father would hand over his daughter with the words, I pledge my daughter for the purpose of producing legitimate offspring. Among the ancient Hebrews, men were free to take several wives, and their wives were required to stay home and tend to the household. If wives failed to produce offspring, their husbands could give them back and marry someone else. Fortunately, many of our societal practices have evolved since then, especially as I'm looking out at the crowd and I see daggers staring at me. Now, eventually religion and the church came along. As the Roman Catholic Church became a powerful institution in Europe, the blessings of a priest became a necessary step for a marriage to be legally recognized. By the eighth century, marriage was widely accepted in the Roman church as a sacrament or a ceremony to bestow God's grace. In addition, the church began to espouse better treatment for wives. Men were taught to show greater respect for their wives and were forbidden from divorcing them. Christian doctrine required new pressures on men to remain faithful. But the church still held that men were the head of families with their wives deferring to their wishes. Now, 
I could continue to go on about the history and the evolution of weddings, but what I'm hoping to get across is this. The wedding at Cana is not just about a wedding or even wine. The wedding at Cana is unique to John's gospel and is the first of Jesus' seven signs in the narrative. It presents an interesting contrast to, the, to next week's text from Luke. Both stories narrate the first acts of Jesus' public ministry, which provide important clues to who Jesus is for the respective gospel community. You see, it's this understanding or practice of public ministry that stands out to me. In many ways, the miracles that Jesus performs in John's gospels are less miracles and more signs. They are signs that signify an important part about who Jesus is. And sure, while turning water into wine is extraordinary, the signs point to other revelations about who Jesus is. This could be an important way for us to move through the season of Epiphany. Revelation for revelation's sake is really not the point. What deeper reality is Jesus revealing to us? What are we supposed to see about Jesus? And thinking about Jesus' first sign of public ministry by turning water into wine at the wedding, I often find myself curious as to why a wedding? And why not another venue? As we see in other gospels, the other writers decide to focus on other parts of Jesus' ministry, whereas again, the wedding is unique to John's gospel. And this is, perhaps, why John is my favorite gospel. I love all of them, but in John, I find a more intimate connection with Jesus' ministry. I think it is because the community of John does a great job of what modern writers do, and that is showing us and not just simply telling us. Jesus' signs show you, they don't just tell you what abundant grace is. Turning water into wine is revealing of abundant grace in this season of Epiphany. And what does abundant grace taste like? It tastes like the best wine when you are expecting the cheap or inferior stuff. It's one thing to be told that Jesus is the source of grace. It's quite another to have an experience of it, to see it. Jesus' grace is a gift of abundance. So in thinking about public ministry, and with tomorrow being Martin, Le Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I can't think of a better person to bring up with Jesus' name. Like Jesus, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed of a world where all people would be treated with dignity and respect. We live in a world that reams with inequality based on religion, race, gender, social status, and the result is social injustice, racism, discrimination, wars, and genocide. This is not God's kingdom. This is not the kingdom that Jesus' public ministry of grace and abundance were working towards. And yet, this is the world we occupy now, even after a few thousand years. However, God's kingdom is coming. Jesus knows that, and I know that. And when God's kingdom fully arrives, there will be no inequality in it. In God's kingdom, there is justice and equality for all. It's the dream that Mar Martin Luther King Jr. saw and spoke so articulately. It's the dream that followers of Christ share. That is why we persistently and continually pray for God's kingdom to come. Followers of Christ are not only praying for God's kingdom to come, but they are also living now for justice and equality. We have been anointed, empowered, and enabled to do this work because of an abundance of God's grace. You see, that same grace that flowed from wine that was once water is the same grace that pours forth from the public ministry we all continue to do today, especially at St. Francis. Whether it is the individual and private ministry that some of us do, you know, some of those ministries that might not be recognized by 
that ministries that might only be recognized by you and God to the very public ministries that we see and hear about. All of those ministries are important and we have an abundance of them here at St. Francis. The work that we all do is important for God's kingdom. Interestingly enough, to return back to the wedding and this first sign of Jesus' public ministry in John, I think again about what a wedding symbolizes. If we ponder what a wedding is about, beyond the pomp and circumstance, the lace, the flowers, or even the legal ramifications, a wedding is about bringing a family together. And so an event that is bringing families together, bringing community together, just makes sense for Jesus' first sign. In our gospel, we are being invited into a journey with Jesus, a journey that kicks off with an act, a sign, that is creating a family much like the family we are being asked to enter into as God's children. In this new family, we are all one. Total unity, void of friction and hate. Just one basic and simple to understand. And what makes us one? Jesus. We are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Race, gender, and social status are all gone. We are treated equally and operate as one. We are part of one body, ministering at the point of need and the power of the Holy Spirit in the midst of an unjust world. Unless we forget, we are operating in a world that has the complication of attempting to function during a global pandemic that waxes and wanes. However, I hope we remain trusting in the power of God's grace to know that the ministry that we all do, whether it is a public ministry or more private acts of faith, are equally good and holy. We have an abundance of God's grace that fills us with hope. May we continue to remember that in the times to come. And may we remember to not just tell people how we are followers of Christ, but also by showing them through love and compassion. Whether it is at a wedding or elsewhere, everyone deserves to experience the abundance of God's grace. Amen. <laughs>